Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for inviting us or having us over. And I'd like to also thank Dr. Harris and uh, Dr. Moody for uh, really good presentations and, and the presentation from Johns Hopkins. Uh, really, really an honor for me uh, to be here to discuss with you a topic um, that I have a lot of passion um, on, and, and my passion goes to myself having a family uh, member who had an aortic aneurysm, not the section of an aortic aneurysm, that's in fact, um, I was in general surgery residency on my way to do transplant surgery and then shift to do aortic surgery or vascular surgery because of that reason. Um, I have no disclosures, uh, nothing to disclose today, and this is the team. So um, at MHI, this is non-inclusive, um, as uh, Dr. Harris and Dr. Moody really uh, highlighted. There are a lot, of, a lot of people in the background working together. Uh, taking care of aortic patients is a really, really complex um, uh, problem. It's, it's a, probably one of the most difficult problems that we deal with at the hospital. People are very, very sick. Uh, and the aorta essentially controls your entire blood, bloodstream. And then you mess with it. It doesn't take too much uh, for the patient to die. So, so it really takes everybody coming together and working together. Our program is really anchored by a quarterback, who's Dr. Harris, who's done an amazing job to um, uh, start the program because they had interest and also welcome people like us uh, and listen to our ideas and what it is that we bring new uh, to the program itself. So really what we've been talking about this afternoon is, is a spectrum of dis disease. It's not one particular condition. So an acute aortic syndrome is really an, a spectrum of the disease with aortic aneurysm being the major part of the spectrum. But there are other conditions such as the aortic dissection, which you see on the, on the table there, a penetrating aortic ulcer, which you see right here. So essentially, uh, you have an ulcer that has penetrating, penetrated through the wall of the aorta. Now the, wall, the patient is bleeding within the wall. Or you have something called IMH, or intramural hematoma, bruising within the wall of the aorta. And this can lead to aortic dissection. Uh, trauma can also cause uh, uh, be iatrogenic, meaning caused by other physician when they're doing a procedure, or a uh, motor vehicle accident can also lead to a dissection. We have other small conditions, but these don't contribute as much. You have to, part, excuse me, I uh, initially made this talk for other physicians, and then yesterday I found out that I was non-physician 90% in our audience, and I went back and, and I started changing it a little bit, so I hope it's not too basic. Uh, so when we started looking at aortic dissection, the way it's classified, we have two different classifications. Really, Dr. DeBakey did a lot of work. Uh, DeBakey classified DeBakey 1, 2, and 3, and DeBakey 3 is A and B. We're not going to talk about that. It's too complicated. It's very important for people who treat aneurysms or dissection to understand the differences. But for the purpose of this talk today, let's fo focus on this. Stanford classification, it simplifies it. A patient who comes in with a Stanford A dissection, that means that the dissection, like Dr. Moody so eloquently described it, starts right at the aortic root and goes all the way down. They involve the valve and, uh, I'm sorry, the arch, all the way down to the descending aorta. Patients with type B aortic dissection, the dissection starts at the subclavian artery, the left subclavian artery, which is the artery that supplies the left arm and the back of the head on the left side. That's where the, the, the aneurysm starts. So why, why the difference? Well, uh, it, it's very important as we will talk about. But I want to highlight uh, for this audience particularly some of the risk factors that put a patient at risk for an aortic dissection. If we start looking at those risk factors, by far, high blood pressure is the most common cause of aortic dissection, as you've seen here. But if a patient has an intramural hematoma, like we see here, they're also a higher rate for a dissection. In fact, someone who has a penetrating aortic ulcer is, 
about one in eight patients with penetrating aortic also will have a progression of the disease to become a, non, a, a, a dissection. Connective tissue disorder, very important cause of aortic dissection. During pregnancy, there's hormonal fluctuation, and also blood pressure can be very high. Uh, there's a condition called preeclampsia or eclampsia, which raises the blood pressure. So women during that time become a higher rate, rate, uh, risk for aortic dissection. Iatrogenic means it's caused while we're doing something else, instrumenting the aorta. Hyperlipidemia, cocaine use raises someone's blood pressure, and this can lead to a dissection. Diabetes and smoking, of course, is very, uh, very important uh, causes. Uh, we have had talk about genetic uh, uh, disease that causes aortic dissection. There's a whole talk this afternoon about that, so I won't mention it, but Marfan, Lois Deeds, uh, uh, some other uh, uh, EDS, so we won't talk about this uh, right now. So when you started looking at aortic dissection, it's actually the most common emergency uh, aside from aortic uh, aneurysm rupture that we get. Uh, but the majority of patients with aortic dissection, I'll say about two-thirds of patients that come to our hospital or anywhere, this is data from IROD that Dr. Harris discussed, two-thirds of the patient will have a type A dissection, meaning that their dissection starts at the aortic root, goes all the way into the aorta. And one-third of the patient will have a type B dissection. And if we dive that deep down, and the patients with type B aortic dissection, you see that 30% of them will have complicated type B aortic dissection, and I'll explain that. And 70% will have non-complicated aortic dissection. And I, again, I'll explain what that means. Uh, by far, five to one, men are more common to have an, a, a dissection than women. So, when we started looking at aortic dissection, there was also an age preference with the dissection, with patients with type A aortic dissection being about 10 years younger than patients with type B aortic dissection. But you guys probably know this. So then I'll, I'll, just, I'll just move on. Historically, like Dr. Moody just explained to us, type A aortic dissection has been thought as an emergency. So patient goes to the operating room, and type B aortic dissection is being managed with anti-impulse therapy or blood pressure management, usually, unless the patient has symptoms. And why is that the case? Well, here's the reason why. Uh, looking at data from IRAD, again, if a patient has a type A aortic dissection and comes in and is managed medically, within 30 days, the chance that they are alive is actually 40%. So 60% of a patient with type A aortic dissection that come in, if they are not operated on, within 30 days they'll be dead. That's for type A aortic dissection. However, if we take the same patient, we offer them surgery, the chance that they won't die, or the mortality decrease significantly to 30, 26%, less than 30%. So we cut by offering patients with type A aortic dissection surgery, we're cutting down mortality from 60% to, to less than 30%, which is a big deal. Now, if you have a patient with type B aortic dissection, the chance, if you offer them surgery, open surgery, their mortality based on IROD is around 30%. That means if your dissection starts from the left subclavian and goes down, your mortality is only 30%. But if you treat them with medications alone, their mortality is about 10%. So why are we doing surgery? So, so, so mortality is higher if we, we open these patients up in an acute setting, so we shouldn't really be doing surgery. Therefore, a lot of people advocated that if you have a type B aortic dissection, unless you have mild perfusion, meaning your bowels are dying, your aorta is rupturing, you're leaking, we shouldn't be fixing in this. Things change, though, later on, as you'll see here. People start rethinking this, and the rethinking really started uh, with the event in, uh, in 1990, a gentleman from Buenos Aires by the name of uh, Carlos Juan Perotti invented a stent graft. A stent graft is actually a sleeve that you can go down in a groin, put, put up, uh, just you can go with a needle poke without even a knife, a needle poke, put a wire up, go up, we find out where the aorta is leaking, you seal it inside and pull that out. 
is believed to, do, to be a minimally invasive way of fixing patients. So these devices were, were, were really created for aneurysm, but people started thinking, should we include people with dissection, treat people with dissection, and why should we? Well, here's the reason why. If a patient undergoes, like Dr. Moody showed, undergoes a simple, comes in with a type aortic dissection, they undergo a repair, which is like this patient here underwent a hemi-arch, meaning that they replaced just a part of the arch. You leave in behind a dissected aorta in the arch and below. And this aorta here is very unpredictable. Nobody knows what this, this patient will have in the future. In fact, up to 70% of patients treated this way will go on to develop aneurysm or aortic rupture, which leads to death or malperfusion or need for another intervention. So then people start thinking maybe we should do more than what we're doing. Because a lot of the times these patients are young, by the time this becomes aneurysmal, they're older, and they might not be able to tolerate a bigger operation. So maybe do the right operation the first time around. With type B aortic dissection, well, fine, we're getting them out of the hospital, they're doing fine, but if you follow these patients that are treated with medications, at 30 day, at uh, five years, 30% of them will be dead from aneurysm. And if you follow them longer than five years, less than 50% of them are alive. So we got to do better. Uh, here's a paper that was published uh, uh, not that long, actually, I think in 2010, uh, looking at a patient that came in with aortic dissection that underwent open surgery and endovascular surgery and those that were treated with medications. Open surgery, meaning we opened the, the, the chest, replaced the aorta. Endovascular, meaning we went through the groin, we put a stent, and medical treatment, meaning they had no surgery. So if you look at those patients, open surgery had a 32% mortality. So clearly, we shouldn't do it. Patient who had uh, medical management, about 10% of them were, uh, died. Those who had medical management and stent graft placement, about seven, they had about 7% mortality. So it's better if we put a stent and, and then on top of treating pa patients with medication. Here is a, uh, a study that was uh, published looking at five years. Patients who come in with no symptoms. They just have a dissection. Uh, we do a CT scan, initially have the dissection. We do a CT scan. We treat them with medication. The symptoms go away. How do these patients do in the long term? What if we take a, oh, these patients, we put stent graft in them, how are they gonna do? Well, they randomized patients, two group of patients, 72 patients in a group that got a stent and treated medically, uh, 68 patients got only medical treatment. Well, what did we find? So what we found about 19, all cause mortality was about 19% in patients that got treated with medications alone versus 11.8%. 1% in patients that got treated with medication and stent. This is our five years. If you follow these patients, you look at the cause uh, aortic specific mortality because that's what we're treating, the difference is even more stark, about 6.9% death compared to 19.3. So treating patients with stent graft, even though they are asymptomatic, is a good thing, but it's not without its consequences. And if you look at the aorta remodeling itself, meaning that the aorta has healed itself. If you have a stent graft place, you have a higher chance of the aorta healing itself. So what are we really talking about when we talk about aortic dissection? I hope uh, this, uh, this picture plays here for you. This is, this is a courtesy of one of our ex-partner, Dr. Dr. Kakatera. You can see here the heart's beating normally. This is how blood travels through the heart. Because the pressure inside the lumen of the heart is so high, eventually you have a tear inside the, in, 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 the, in the wall. So now instead of having one channel, you have two channels all of a sudden. So you have heart going into, uh, blood going into the true channel and then the false channel. So coming in, putting the sleeve inside, then heals the, the aorta over time. So this is what we're talking about uh, with endovascular repair. Essentially, we are coming in, we are trying to cover the port where the blood went in so that we can go ahead and, and uh, heal the rest of the aorta. The problem with this is the case that I showed you is very straightforward, is very simple. Most patients will come in with multiple entry, there, 
here and here. So even after we put a sleeve inside, the, the, the aorta doesn't always heal, which we'll, you will see. So we have, we have to do other, other, other procedure. So how do we decide, type B aortic dissection, how do we decide? This is what goes in through our mind. Once the patient comes in with a type B aortic dissection, we don't rush the patient to the operating room. We wait. Even if they have certain characteristic that we think predisposes them to, for the aorta to become an aneurysm or later on, they, there's a good reason to wait. So we wait for these patients, but we, we risk stratify them. Are they low risk or high risk patients? If they're low risk patients, then we, uh, that meaning they have no symptom, blood pressure, well control, that it's not changing the aortic diameter, we discharge these patients home. We see them again in four weeks. At that four weeks, we get another scan, we're looking at the aorta, we're comparing it to the first scan that they got during the hospitalization. And if there's no change, then we look, see them again in six months, and then we start seeing them yearly. However, if there's a change, what we're looking at a change, we're looking at the size of the aorta overall is greater than four centimeter. The size of the entry that we saw above there, more than 15 millimeter, or the false lumen to the true lumen ratio is greater than six, then these patients should really be treated, and we proceed with treating these patients. So what does it really mean uh, to this patient? What about patient with intramural hematoma? Patient with intramural hematoma can be very deceiving. They're very difficult to, to, to really follow. Because you would think that if someone has just a bruising inside the wall, in, within the wall of the aorta, if you treat them with the medications, they actually will, uh, will heal, and that's the truth. But if they have rupture, or they have ischemic end organ, or if they have pain that is not going away, or if the hematoma is close to the heart, like type A, then we'll call Dr. Moody to fix it, uh, or his teammates. Um, and, and if the aorta is greater than four, four, 40 millimeter or four centimeter, if you have an expansion, if you have a, someone who has an aneurysm, and then you have an intramural hematoma above the area where the aorta was normal, that patient should be fixed. Because if you wait on those patients, usually they don't do well. Um, if you have a patient has undergone a previous repair and they show up to have another, another uh, intramural hematoma, those patients should really be, be fixed. Here's a first case. I'm going to show you probably six cases of patients that I have fixed. This gentleman came to us, was uh, flown. Uh, I started with uh, MHI in 2013. This is in the summer, one of my very first emergencies that I did. Uh, he presented to his primary care physician in North Dakota with uh, abdominal pain that he was experiencing after eating. Uh, every time you eat, it will get pain. And then he lost 30 pounds and he had diarrhea and couldn't eat. So they did a CT scan and they found that the artery that supplies his bowel was blocked. So the surgeon, uh, most uh, rightly so, came from the arm, put a Y in the catheter, and came here, was trying to fix the artery down here. In so doing, though, he dissected the entire aorta. The patient started complaining of severe pain on the table. This was done under local anesthesia, so the patient was awake. So the rest of the patient got a CT scan and called us and transferred the patient to, to a hospital. So we saw the patient, and we went from the arm, from the, uh, from the, from the groin, we put a wire and came up here. You can see, so this here is a true lumen that you see down here. This over here is a false lumen. This is the entry tear. You see that the aorta is into multiple parts. The bright, uh, bright color, that's the true lumen. The darker color, color, that's the false lumen. So we put a stent in the gentleman, and six months later, that's what we got. So his aorta has been able to heal because we put the stent, and he's doing well. He's actually seven years, seven years out. We get a, a scan back home. Um, and he sends, he sends us a scan, we, we, we surveil him every, every, every year. Uh, so which patient with uncomplicated type, type B aortic dissection should we treat? Well, there are certain characteristics, even if a patient has a type B aortic dissection, that should make a surgeon, that make us, makes us think twice or follow this patient a little, a little shorter. And this is backed by all the evidence that's been published. Most of the evidence has been published from IRAD institution, uh, IRAD uh, organization. If the patient is having pain, you, you treat the patient blood pressure, the blood pressure pain goes away, but then the pain comes back. 
that's a sign that this patient's gonna go ahead and rupture, and this patient should be treated. If the patient, you're giving the patient all the blood pressure, blood pressure medications you have, but the blood pressure is not well controlled, this patient should be treated before they leave hospital. Otherwise, they'll probably uh, rupture. Uh, unfortunately, if the patient with a type B aortic dissection is older than 70%, the chance of death is actually really high uh, in, in those groups. That's also from circulation from IRADs. If the aortic volume is greater than four centimeter or the, they have an aneurysm already, we look at the uh, false lumen 22 millimeter or bigger. If the false lumen is partially thrombosed, what we're trying to do, like Dr. Moody explained, is that we're trying to completely thrombose the false lumen. But if it's only partially thrombosed, that's actually predicted that these patients are going to go ahead and do wash over time. So we want to treat that. We want to make sure we take care of that. We want to look at the entry there, uh, which we talked about earlier. So how do we do it? Again, I'm not going to go over this uh, because Dr. Harris and Dr. Moody explained. We do it in a hybrid room. Uh, we want to make sure we have an inventory. This is a multidisciplinary approach, vascular surgery, cardiovascular surgery, re interventional radiologists sometimes. Sometimes we even need general surgeons because sometimes the bowel is dead and the bowel needs to be taken out because there's no blood flow. Uh, after we're done in the operating room, the work doesn't stop there. Patient has to go up to the ICU and you need a good team taking care of the patients. Here's a, a patient. Uh, this gentleman is actually a professor at the university uh, who, uh, age 62, uh, woke up in the morning with chest, uh, chest pain going at the back. He was admitted to another institution uh, for about a week and he developed diarrhea because they also had a, y, a, a high Y count. Even though they didn't have a source for his diarrhea, they treated him with antibiotics for his infection before. They treated him with antibiotics. And then he started having diarrhea. They said, well, he has C. diff, which is an infection of the colon. And then they discharged him to a rehabilitation facility. When he got there, the same night, he has severe pain, uh, and he's uh, now transferred back to our institution. Here's a Scott scan uh, that we got uh, when it got to our institution. You see that it has a dissection that starts uh, up in a uh, distal to the subclavian. It's coming down. I'm going to scroll back up. You can see the true and the false lumen. And you see blood already in the chest at this level. This is blood that you see here. So, so this aorta is leaking at some place. And when you come down, it has a true lumen and a false lumen uh, into the celiac SMA and all the way down, which are the arteries that supply the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bowel. This is the angiogram that I did. So I have now access, needle poked through both groin, and I have put a catheter up, and I shoot an angiogram. When I do an angiogram, I see here, I can see a little bit of the left kidney artery. I can see the right kidney artery. This here is supposed to be the superior mesenteric artery, but you don't see it that well. When you look down here, this is the inferior mesenteric artery that you can see here. This here is uh, the artery here, is, it's a collateral, it's called the meandering mesenteric. It connects the superior mesenteric artery to the inferior mesenteric artery. So it so turns out that this gentleman, uh, superior mesenteric artery is actually blocked. So what's supplying his bowel, and the reason why he was having diarrhea when he was eating is because his bowel did not have blood flow. So only the small little artery was supplying his entire intestine, his, his liver, and his spleen. That was the reason why he was having this. And in this gentleman, uh, again, working from, uh, from the groin, we were able to go ahead and put a stent. So this is the stent graft that you see from the subclavian down. Now you can see the celiac access. You can see the superior mesenteric artery. You can see the right and the left renal artery. This is two years postoperatively. You can see that the aorta is well healed uh, up top. You don't see any more dissection there. Even the place where we didn't put a stent is now healed. There's still a dissection right at the celiac and superior mesenteric artery, as you will see in a little bit, but we are co constantly monitoring. What we tell these patients, once you have a dissection, you become our patient for life. Uh, we have to follow you to, to the very end. And, and you, can, you can see all the way down, his aorta is well healed. He's doing quite well. I'm sorry, right, we gotta go forward. So, once in a while, we'll have patients that will come in 
with a dissection in the arch, sorry, and those patients should really be treated by open surgery. But if they are high-risk patients, meaning they, they won't tolerate surgery, then we, we might be stuck. Here's the case with one of my uh, partner who is a cardiothoracic surgeon who just retired. This was his friend who came in with chest pain going to the back, 78 years, years old. Uh, we managed him medically. He was discharged home. The pain recurs, and he comes back. And uh, the surgeon told me he's not a good candidate for an open operation. And his dissection involved this artery right here, which is a subclavian. Actually, I extended down. I, I made the sketch myself, so I didn't do such a good job. So um, this patient here we chose to treat in a different way. What it is is we designed a graph with a hole uh, for him. So we have access in the a, in a arm here on the left side. We have a wire from the arm coming down. We have access in the groin, and the left groin and the right groin. And we got a wire from the groin here. We pulled the wire out in the arm. We get what we call through and through access. And once we have that done, we made a stent in the back table with a hole to accommodate the artery here. And now we've pushed the stent from the, from the groin on the right side and pushed it back up. And here's the stent, making sure we marked this. Uh, that's the nominate artery, that's the left carotid artery, and that's the subclavian artery. And we deployed it. Uh, I had a movie here, but I don't think it's going to play. Uh, I'm sorry about that. But you can see the angiogram right here showing now we have this, and now we want to connect this. And we connect this with another stent, and we do an angiogram. We see that the aneurysm now is gone. Uh, all the arteries are well perfused. This is Scott scan uh, uh, that we got this year, in fact, uh, showing that his, his uh, dissection is completely gone. All the target vessels are very well perfused. So why do we follow these patients for, for life? Well, the reason why we follow these patients for life, because I can show you one publication after another, after another, after another, showing, a, showing that even after we put a stent, even after we do the frozen elephant trunk that Dr. Moody showed, the distal stent, the distal uh, false lumen in 20% of the patients will still leak back. And if it's leaking back, then that it can grow and the patient can have an aneurysm and rupture again. This is a case that we, uh, we did not that long ago. This is a patient that actually had a type B aortic dissection that we stented. Uh, once we stented him, unfortunately, he had another entry tear that was right around this area here, so we were not able to stent this. When we followed up, we, did, we do a CT scan. You see the bright contrast material should really stay inside the stent, but now contrast material is coming back and going back outside of the stent. So we have to find a way to go back and try to seal wherever the leak is. And in this case, we use a material called M-plot to plug. Um, we came in with a wire and a catheter from the groin, we got into this leak here, and we came up, put a wire and a catheter up here and released this material. And you can see that on follow-up CT scan, now the aorta is healed, and all the blood is redirected into that, and the aorta is healing. Uh, in the United States, the FDA has a lot of regulation, and we're constantly behind, even though a lot of the toys that are being used to treat patients with aortic dissections are made by U.S. company. And here's, a, here's a, an example of this, uh, this device made by Cook. It's called a candy plug. Uh, this is a very important device that's been used in Europe since 2012 and made here in Bloomington, Indianapolis, and yet it's not released in the United States. This is a very good device that can be used in patients with that section. But we can mimic our own device. We can try on, in a back table to use our own device because we, we know how it's, it's done. Uh, we can play with this in a back table, and here's a case. This is a gentleman that I, with type B aortic dissection that I treated in 2013 as well. Uh, we do a CT scan in 2014, October. His aneurysm sac is 65 uh, millimeter, meaning 6.5 centimeter. And the reason why is because it's leaking back from here all the way up. And we use that technique exactly in the back table. We're able to sneak into the, uh, the, the, the false lumen, and we plugged it. We put M-plots to plug. As you can see, in 2015, the aneurysm sac is 
52 millimeter, and in 2017 is 35 millimeters, shrinking. The aorta is finally healing. Uh, I was going to show a case that actually Dr. Moody was involved in with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Judah Askew and I uh, did not that long ago. This is an 83-year-old male that came in with uh, type B aortic dissection. Uh, I, I'm sorry, type A aortic dissection. This a case that Dr. Moody showed that we work again, uh, together with uh, cardiothoracic surgery. As you can see here, uh, this is CT scan. Uh, you see his aorta is dissected. Uh, from his arch, all the, uh, from his uh, ascending aorta, the arch, all the way down his, his true lumen is truly compressed. If you go up, which I show you right there, you see severe compression of the true lumen compared to the false lumen. So he's not getting much blood down into his gut and his lower extremities. Uh, but when you come down, you can see that the left kidney also is not being perfused, and they very well, uh, this uh, gentleman actually came in with paralysis, unable to move uh, the left lower extremity, and the reason for that was because, as you'll see on a CT scan here in a little bit, the artery right here was completely blocked, 100%. That supplies the, uh, the, left, uh, the, right, the right leg. So in this case, we did uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Moody and Dr. Askew and myself, uh, did uh, exactly what Dr. Moody described. They replaced the arch, and I came from below. We stented the, uh, the, uh, the aorta below, and this is CT scan at one month. Uh, he's still doing really, really well. So, sorry, that's... Uh, so, what has been our outcomes? So a lot of people say, well, well, these people are so sick, you shouldn't really go back up and, and do these big surgery. And that's true. Some patients uh, we, we should see and, and we, should, we should really uh, give them a minimum operation compared to maximum operation. But since 2015, that's when we really started thinking about being more aggressive with both type A and type B aortic dissection. Uh, since then, the mortality, in our, this is our program, has been 9% as, as, a, as compared to 31% before that. And the reason for that is because we've had a lot of people with interest, um, a big group of people taking care of patients, and, and again, the leadership of uh, Dr. Kevin Harris. And I'll leave you with this uh, wise uh, uh, saying from uh, the Dalai Lama, and thank you very much for the opportunity again.